Welcome and thank you for joining us this Sunday night, the first of the May Sunday self care series for Connect RN. Uh, this talk is entitled Finding the Strength to Support, Taking Care of Yourself to Take Care of Others. So, before we jump into everything, the whole purpose of the Sunday self-care series is because this month is actually Mental Health Awareness Month, and the theme actually is Together for Mental Health. So I am very honored and feel privileged to be here with you, especially if you are in the nursing or CNA community. I think that you all are doing incredibly important work and have been doing so over the past few years, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Um, also, I should mention that this week also kicks off Maternal Mental Health Awareness Week. And through the presentation, you'll see that there's a lot geared towards our nurses and CNAs who are also working mothers. Um, your, your tireless effort is appreciated. And thank you, of course, to Connect RN for making the space for nurses and for CNAs to feel heard and safe and supported through this conversation. So I wanted to start off with a grounding exercise for everybody. The idea of this is I'm sure that you guys like me are doing a million things or did a million things today. I obviously it's a Sunday, so I have my kids and had to figure out dinner on the table, but at the same time had to work out, but at the same time had to make sure that I looked presentable for you today. So I wanted to start off with a grounding exercise for everybody. So I want everybody to inhale for four seconds. Hold that for seven seconds and then exhale for X, eight seconds. And that is going to be some rhythmic breathing that we do together. That idea of rhythmic breathing is to ease anxiety and lower blood pressure. So we'll do inhale for four, hold for seven, and exhale for eight. Okay. And we'll do that together just one more time. That's an inhale for four, a hold for seven, and an exhale for eight. Try and do that twice a day because most of our stress and anxiety actually comes when our body and our breath aren't aligned. And that's one way that you can get them back aligned and create a relaxed breathing pattern. And as I mentioned, you guys are doing incredible work right now. So you've likely found yourself experiencing stress and new in different ways this year. And that affects how we, and if you see me looking to the side, I'm admitting folks, so apologies for that. But it affects how we think and how we feel and how we act. And our mental health determines how we handle stress, obviously, how we relate to others, which is incredibly important in your field, and how we make choices. It can be why we're feeling good, why we're feeling bad, or just different altogether. And all of that might be amplified right now from the incredible stress and the uncertainty of our lives right now. So it is a pleasure to be with you. Those two people that I spoke with that I had to take care of this, to, this morning, this afternoon, and every day are my children. They're pictured here. Um, that's Maya, who is now 10 years old. These photos are a little bit outdated. I need to get new family photos taken, but one more thing to do, right? And then my son, West, who is seven. I wanted to show you who I've learned a lot about mental health from. These are the people who certainly improve my mental health, but test my mental health, but bring me joy and give me purpose and passion and reason for investing in my mental health. So I'm sure you can 100% relate. Uh, the mental health of me and all working professionals right now is a passion of mine, in particular, the physical and emotional and mental health of folks like you, those in critical public self sectors like law enforcement, like public education, and of course, healthcare. I have had the opportunity and pleasure to work on the maternal initiatives of Vice President Kamala Harris, and I've received a congressional citation from the US Senate for going above and beyond and ensuring that black moms and moms of color have access to important health information for their children and for their families. So the mental health of women, especially working mothers is very important to me. So before we get into the presentation, I wanted to have an icebreaker with everybody and just give you an opportunity to learn a little bit about me, but learn a little bit about you as well, to help you just 
clear your minds aside from the grounding exercise in a fun way and, and let me know a little bit about you and just be in the moment together. So I usually start off every presentation with this slide. I always ask if you could only pick three and drop it in the chat and let me know. If you could only pick three of these things, what would you choose and why? So feel free to just put in the chat which three it would be. And I can also tell you what I hear quite frequently from folks who do my talks. I mean, listen to the talks. We have leggings, Starbucks, cake, or some type of dessert, Target, wine, Netflix. There's um, just being completely alone, carbs, um, the internet, and then sports. If you could only choose three, what would you choose? I will tell you, for me, it will always be Starbucks because I cannot live without coffee. It would be Netflix uh, because I'm addicted to streaming services, especially Disney Plus and Netflix. And then just complete and utter silence being alone by yourself. I live for that. That's when I am able to recharge and and not hear mom, I need, or I want a million times a day. I see them coming in now, coffee, wine, and internet. Yes, can't lie, <laughs> can't live without. Yes, I love it, I love it. Um, what I hear the most from folks is leggings, Target, and wine. Those are the number one, two, and three, leggings, Target, and wine. So I'm gonna go to the, to the next slide here. Mental health includes our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. The average delay onset of mental illness symptoms and actual treatment is 11 years. So if you can imagine, if you had a broken leg, I doubt any of us would wait 11 years to actually be seen by a doctor for that. Yet so many of us go without getting our, uh, excuse me, without getting our symptoms diagnosed for 11 years. Anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness in the US, affecting 40 million adults in the US, 18 and older, or about 18% of the population every year. And while one in five people will experience a diagnosable mental health condition in their lives, only, excuse me, five out of five people will go through a challenging time that affects their mental health. So we all have gone through something that has certainly affected our emotional, our psychological, or our social well-being. Close to half of full-time workers right now are dealing with mental health issues. Mental health at work is absolutely a topic that needs to be discussed. Many have seen job demands increase or are struggling to balance home and work life. Just 22% of baby boomers and 36% of Generation X have reported their mental health issues, but that's compared to 59% of millennials and 71% of Gen Zers. So there's definitely a trend in discussing mental, mental health as the demographics are younger and younger. And almost one in 10 workers say that substance abuse or addiction, unfortunately, has affected their productivity or caused them to miss work. More than one third of those struggling with addiction said it's affected their work to a greater extent during the pandemic. And then with regards to mental health at work in the healthcare industry, women account for three quarters of full-time year-round healthcare workers. Healthcare requires those women to exude a great deal of care and empathy, as I'm sure many of you know. Nearly two thirds say their workloads have gotten worse over the last two years, while a quarter report that their employer rarely or never backfills positions left vacant by illness or vacation. In August two years ago, the US Census reported that um, uh, women accounted for the three quarters of the full-time year-round healthcare workers, but healthcare requires a great deal um, of care and empathy. Again, females compared to men show higher signs of emotional responsivity. The COVID era healthcare landscape in the US, you can see 34% is the percentage growth of healthcare workers just in the past two years. 37% um, increase in the uptick among women in healthcare. 28% increase in the uptick among men in healthcare who actually left their roles. And 67% is the women's share of healthcare workers who left their roles in the past two years because of the pandemic. 
nursing, as you can see, that industry is the second largest growth in job transitions, only second to pharmacy at 47%. So healthcare roles have definitely seen a lot of pandemic era exits. Your industry, your specific roles, in fact, um, have seen the second highest. And working parents who are healthcare workers are suffering too. 50% of families have had one or both parents leave the workforce, either reduce their hours or take a leave of absence. We are still, and yes, still seeing insufficient options for childcare two years into the pandemic and caregiving driving the attrition. 56% of parents that need childcare still don't have access to full-time reliable care. A third of parents report their mental health benefits would make them feel more supported, but amidst the pandemic, only a quarter of employees are expanding their mental health services. And as a result, Close to half of working parents are leaving due to insufficient compensation, more than likely to cover for child care, or because of the booming job market, or the need for more flexibility. And according to the Labor Department's latest report, 865,000 women left the workforce in September of 2020. So if you can imagine if every woman in DC and Baltimore and Richmond, Virginia stopped working, that would be that 865,000. It would be close to, I'm sorry, the, the amount of women who stopped working in one month alone in, in 2020, just due to gender inequity is absolutely devastating. And women had to leave due to prioritizing their caregiving responsibilities over their career ambition. But when you dig deeper into that labor department data on women's employment, it actually uncovers a more problematic issue for the healthcare industry. So of all the industries reported, the largest decline of female employment lies in the government industry. In that report, that counts as critical public sectors like law enforcement, public education, elected officials, and unfortunately, healthcare. So with all of that devastating data, I am very curious to hear if any of you think that you've hit a pandemic wall. You can put in the, um, this bit.ly here, this URL, or I also have it in the chat if you wanted to add it. Um, just highlight it and copy it and put it into your browser if you can. Very curious to see, and I can share with you all um, just an overall number of if you feel like you've hit a pandemic wall. And what hitting a pandemic wall is, it's similar to a running metaphor, hitting the wall. It describes the phenomenon of suddenly running out of energy halfway through a long race. I think about how I, I run, certainly not a marathon runner, but I will run around my neighborhood and think that the Backstreet Boys will carry me all the way through my running and I will get halfway about one or two miles and realize, oh God, now I have to turn around and either run or walk the way back. And that is the equivalent of hitting a, a, the wall in running. So I'm gonna check this out and see, let's see the survey results and see how many of you are reporting. Okay. So far, 100% from the folks who are putting in their responses, 100% have hit a pandemic wall. Not surprising. I usually see that. So thank you for reporting. At the end of the day, nurse, oh, I'm sorry, you have a blank screen. Oh no. <laughs> I will, we'll try and get that fixed for you. One second. At the end of the day, nurse moms and dads are in the unique position of caring for others at work and at home. Some working parents are the primary breadwinner for a multi-generational family. That's definitely the case in a lot of multicultural families, which makes them restless, time-pressed, and tense. For them as nurses, one world morphs into the other, and many of you, that's the case. You probably feel like you're constantly in giver mode. You struggle with boundaries, and we tend to, to put, you, excuse me, you tend to put yourselves and your own needs at the bottom of the to-do list. But the reality is that boundaries are key for survival, and they ensure that survival mode isn't our default way of being. 
So I wanted to show you guys this video from Alyssa All Day. She is a YouTuber who also happens to be a nurse. She has started her nursing career in the pandemic. I'm sure many of you can relate to that. Um, trauma is described as a deeply distressing or disturbing experience. And the effects of the pandemic have been traumatizing for us all. But I think uh, with Alyssa, there's no greater example of dealing with trauma while going through the pandemic. She is a Wisconsin wife and mother of two. She is a full-time nurse and a mother to a chronically ill child. And her story resonated with me and I share it with all of my presentations, but I'm especially thankful to share it with you right now uh, because she was vlogging her journey of trying to stay sane, as she says, through the chaos and remain positive, even when it feels like the world is against her. So I'm gonna play this for you guys. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another day in my life. I'm trying to drink water because I'm awful at drinking water at work. Awful. It's kind of hard when you're stuck in a room. I shouldn't say stuck, but like when you're in a room and you don't, you only, you only get two breaks. So I just made some coffee. I've been having like pre-workout before work. Did you hear that thunder? But see, I wanted to go grab my. What am I trying to think of? I wanted to grab my camera, but it's in my car and it's storming out. So I'm just gonna use my phone for this beginning portion of today's vlog but I'm gonna bring you guys along with it is Friday TGIF I was on call last weekend so my weekend after call I'm always like super excited to just to do to just you know just chill I've pretty much been having iced coffee but today I'm gonna do hot here's my creamer I get this creamer at Target and it's super good it did not work out this morning which kind of stinks but I've been only getting like less than six hours of sleep lately. Just, I've been really stressed out about the girls' whole school thing, which update, um, I had to drop my FTE at work so I can homeschool the kids like on the days that they're home, which really, really <laughs> is stressful, but I've been stressed and not sleeping and I'm so under caffeinated. So I'll talk to you guys when I have some more of this stuff. Yesterday, my cactus fell. So currently it's in a bowl because this guy, his little pokey things are very pokey. One eternity later. I am finally done with work. I am so happy it's Friday, you guys. I had a super crazy day. I did like really random stuff today at work. I had Let's see, what did I do? Colonoscopy, and then I did a port placement, which was so quick, it occurred on my lunch break. And then I had two DNCs, so it's kind of a random day, but I'm glad I'm done. I'm getting Starbucks. I couldn't tell you the last time I got Starbucks. I really try not to get it very much, especially since I'm gonna be cutting down my hours. I, we really need to be like super careful, obviously, financially. Future me editing. Cheers. So this weekend I'm gonna budget. It feels so weird. Absolutely, I love Alyssa's honesty, but my heart goes out to her. I can't even imagine nothing was going right for her, but that is a day in her life. Everything, well, from the moment she woke up, everything was going wrong. And then she's got to show empathy to patients. And then she's got to uh, be welcoming and warm. And it's, it's a lot. I can only imagine what you guys are going through. If you have a moment, I highly encourage you to watch uh, or follow Alyssa's story, Alyssa All Day, again on YouTube. She has tons of videos. Side note, if you thought um, as you were reading this event description, what is a social determinant? That's perfectly all right. According to the Center for Disease Control, social determinants of health determine 50% of a person's health outcome. They are the conditions in which people live, learn, work, and play. So where you work is definitely uh, affecting, it is a social determinant of your health. And one of the biggest consequences to a negative social determinant is disconnection or a lack of ambient belonging. That is feeling comfortable in this space, like you're accepted and valued and included. And even prior to COVID, unfortunately, many underrepresented groups didn't have a sense of ambient belonging. 
non-white parents have absolutely been disproportionately affected by the pandemic inside and outside of the workplace. 40% uh, of all working parents are considering leaving their job and non-white parents are 28% more likely to actually do so. Black women self-report that only one in three managers have checked in on them. And that's defined as checking in on their status, their condition, or their well-being. Only 46% of LGBTQ parents feel like they can be themselves at work. And they are twice less satisfied with their jobs, with their compensation, and with their benefits as a whole. Thinking back to Alyssa's video, I'm curious how many of you are Alyssa or have gone through experiences similar to Alyssa where you just wake up in the morning and it's already starting and you still have to go in and be the best nurse or CND that you can be. Or how many of you are a member of one of those represented groups that's having your social determinant of health really tested and not feeling like you are really belonging in the space. Um, put a heart emoji or a yes, if you could, into the chat. I would love to see um, anything. Oh, I'm seeing the hearts already. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. So what can be done? So there are some simple things that every person can say or do to not only serve as allies, but also uh, for everyone in their lives who are struggling to get through the tough times, even outside of the workplace. I mean, a lot of you saw all those hearts, so you can serve as an ally to others. And we will talk about how to serve as an ally to yourself too. But the first being practicing active listening. So active listening is different than just hearing what a person has to say. A good active listener puts everything aside and gives their complete attention to the person who is talking. They ask open-ended questions to get more details, like how did that make you feel? What happened next? And takes moments throughout the conversation to summarize what they've been told and make sure they're understanding clearly. Ask what you can do. So it can be tempting to assume what would be helpful for somebody, but it's always better to ask what they need from you. If you ask and you get nothing, I'm fine, offer up some suggestions. Like, would, would it be too pushy to say, would you like me to come sit with you? Would you like me to watch a movie with you? Would you like me to cook you a meal or pick up a few things for you at the store? Or in the workplace, can you help somebody advance in their career? For example, nearly half of men feel like they've advanced in their careers more or as much as expected throughout this whole pandemic. While for women, it's only one in three. How can you ask another woman what, what you can do as a male ally? Don't compare. So if a friend or a loved one is going through a tough situation and they come to you for support, you might feel tempted to tell them about something that happened to you and how you dealt, through, dealt with the problem. I am a big, big, um, I, I, this is one of my biggest faults. I do that constantly, I must say. It is okay to share similar experiences, but be careful not to compare because it can make someone feel like their pain isn't valid, which is why I am personally working on this. For instance, if they're telling you about a breakup, don't talk about how hard you uh, had it when you went through a divorce. Focus on what you did to cope through the situation without uh, sharing feelings of loss or loneliness. Offer to join them. So again, similar to what you can do and asking what you can do, when somebody is going through a time of sadness or uncertainty, their emotions can take over and leave them feeling paralyzed and unable to take care of themselves. So if you offer to take care of some of their responsibilities, like going to the grocery store or attending doctor's appointments or picking up dry cleaning, it can actually help them feel a sense of accomplishment and lift their spirits. Keep your word. So if you've offered your support to someone and told them that you would do something, it's so important to keep your word to that person. When they're struggling and their mental health is being tested, the last thing they need to do is feel abandoned by somebody else. If you absolutely can't honor your promise, then offer a sincere apology and recommend another time that you would be willing to help. And then know when more serious help is needed. 
as, as health professionals, I'm sure that you guys know sometimes the support you offer isn't enough and a specialist is needed. So if you have an, uh, someone that you're trying to serve as an ally for and they've been struggling for weeks or months, and they're showing signs of a mental health condition and need professional help, don't be afraid to encourage them to seek that out um, and offer to find to, uh, excuse me, offer to help them find help if needed. While awareness of mental health is increasing, we still face a world where emotional and psychological and social well-being are unfortunately met with stigma. Many people don't know how to address their own mental health and are often at a loss on how to help others. People who experience distress may try and keep their feelings hidden because they're afraid of people's responses. I think it's absolutely wonderful that Alyssa was willing to vlog her story, but how much of that would she be really willing to share with her coworkers without a camera being around? This looks sometimes like battling imposter syndrome and summit syndrome, and over time, it can lead to concerns with overall health, stress management and coping. So what is imposter syndrome? It's that nagging feeling that you don't belong and it affects women and minority groups disproportionately, just as your industry over indexes with women and minority groups. Unfortunately, so does imposter syndrome. 70% of the population has experienced it from time to time. But those are usually high achievers who are unable to internalize or accept their success and often attribute their accomplishments to luck rather than to ability and fear that others will eventually unmask them as frauds. And then when imposter syndrome is unacknowledged, it leads to summit syndrome or the act of chasing an unattainable high. Summit syndrome spawned from imposter syndrome in the workplace looks like the unnecessary acquisition of advanced degrees and board memberships and other self-destructive behavior to your mental health. And summit syndrome leads to burnout and burnout we know very well that B word is something that's carried for the past two years. It's that state of emotional and physical and mental exhaustion caused by excessive and prolonged stress. And since March of 2020, the US has led the Google search trend of the phrase, what is burnout syndrome? Related topics include psychological stress and major depressive disorder. So all of that is being searched by the US pretty much on a daily basis. I find it very, very um, interesting as a mother that related March 19th was when the first large state, when California implemented their lockdown and parents were forced to start homeschooling their children. I don't think that's a coincidence. If you've ever had to homeschool children, especially in the middle of the pandemic, it's not a coincidence. <laughs> when you're experiencing burnout, the thing that is often most noticeable is just your lack of energy. And sometimes that can come in the form of physical exhaustion. It can be that. Um, and sometimes it comes in an emotional exhaustion and it just feels like you're completely at your wits end and you can't even process any more information. But then there's another aspect of burnout on top of that that just leaves you feeling negative and disconnected from other people or your work. And unlike the energy to exhaustion spectrum, when, which you're like, most likely to notice in yourself, although you may ignore it, other people are more likely to notice that aspect of burnout in you before you even do. And then the last aspect of burnout is the hardest one to recognize. And it's the hardest one to understand too. It's about how you're responding to your environment, which is so, so critical for your industry. The easiest way to think about it, it has to do with your own feelings of productivity. So note that it's not about how productive you are and how productive you actually are. It's about how productive you feel, which is why the imposter syndrome and summit syndrome and burnout are all related. For those brave enough to share in the chat, and again, brave enough, you do not have to, but let, let us know, are you experiencing imposter syndrome, summit syndrome, burnout, or a combination of all three? I will tell you, you are 100% not alone if you share. And I often see people tell me I'm experiencing a combination of all three at any time. And it's important to note that 
summit syndrome isn't only causing burnout right now. The pandemic is causing burnout as well, just overall. For example, again, women being the primary breadwinner for their homes, especially if it's a multi-generational home where they're caring for children and caring for an aging parent during the pandemic leaves a lot of us restless and time pressed and tense and accelerates that burnout. So what can be done? What can we do to take care of ourselves? The best way to overcome imposter syndrome is to acknowledge it as a form of fear and worry. A study found that 85% of what we worry about will never actually happen. And the 15% that does happen, the majority of folks found that it didn't happen in the way they thought it would. So they handled the difficulty better than expected or it taught them a lesson worth learning. So worst case scenario, nine times out of 10, not really gonna be the worst case scenario. That's, that's comforting. Um, overcoming summit syndrome. The best way to do that is stop comparisons to colleagues and friends and where they are in their mental health journey. 62% of people say social media sites make them feel inadequate about their own life or their achievements. I want you guys to stop for a minute and think about that data. 62% of people say that. So if you put that into perspective, that means that at any given time, at least six out of the 10 of your friends or your family or your colleagues are going through adjectives associated with imposter syndrome or summit syndrome, just like you. So we're all going through this together. Again, five out of five of us will battle uh, uh, something that will affect our mental health. So we are all going through this together. When we compare ourselves to colleagues and friends, we're most likely just comparing ourselves to people who feel like imposters too. And then overcoming burnout. To avoid burnout, we should consider what we're saying yes to when in fact we should be saying no or not at this time. There's nothing wrong with that. Separate your own issues from someone else's. Get input on your priorities. I hope that that is the biggest takeaway for everybody is that not everything has to be completed immediately. There's nothing wrong with no and not at this time or can I get some support here? But if you're already in burnout and to recover from it, in that moment, recognize it because at that moment, it's too late to change it, right? You're already in the middle of the burnout, but refocus in the face of adversity. So recognize it, refocus, and know that moving forward, you have to be real about your bandwidth and what's really driving or inspiring you. Recognize it, refocus, get real. And then I am a huge fan of the senses and leveraging the power of the senses. Just this photo alone, it just, I'm a huge essential oil fan. If anybody watches Bob's Burgers and Linda's sister, Gail, how she just loses her mind over the smell of peppermint, that's me. I am so into essential oils. Um, it's an action that helped me overcome burnout. And I feel like leveraging senses is nine times out of 10 what I hear from folks, what they do to overcome it. Find something to look at every day that brings you joy. It's a great time to organize photos or to remember great times when you feel that. Um, indulge in a scent like I do that you find calming. It might be a lavender candle or a bundle of eucalyptus branches. I'm a big fan of crushing eucalyptus branches and having them in the shower. Others might prefer the smell of baked goods. I do too, but carbs don't prefer me. Uh, scent has a certain power over you. Even, even though you're at home or when you're at home or even when you're at work, smells can transform your surroundings and the way you feel. Make a playlist of your favorite songs that make you happy or listen to nature sounds on YouTube. Listen to a comedy album. It doesn't have to be something that's so serene, but your mental health goals should be around practicing self-compassion, seeking support, delegating responsibilities, setting boundaries. All of that is, 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 is constantly, when, you, when you're indulging and leveraging your senses, it has a way of triggering that in you and reminding you of your mental health goals. And then being a caregiver at home, how can you be a caregiver at home? Well, stop multitasking, focus on one specific activity that you know that you can get done. 
challenge yourself to complete something, set a timer for 10 to 15 minutes and only focus on that one activity until it's completed. Take more breaks throughout your day. Actually take the time to decompress. Take advantage of a 15 minute break if you have the opportunity to have one. Get outside, smell fresh air, walk around, put your feet to pavement and then chunk similar tasks together when you can, making sure that you're optimizing your time and being productive over being perfect. Scheduling tasks based on your energy level. So if you know that there's something that you have to do in the house like vacuum or put up some shelf, is that really something that you should be doing at the end of the day? Is that when you're most productive or is it best for you to save that for the morning or the mid-afternoon? Cut down on your to-do list. Again, does everything have to be completed right now or can it be completed at another time? Turn off notifications. They are just a constant reminder of what you have to do or what somebody else is doing and wants you to know about. And switch to pen and paper. I'm a huge fan of pen and paper as a writer because I feel like it's just easier to remember things when I'm actually putting pen to paper versus typing it. And it also helps me to really think about and prioritize what's important versus just writing a laundry list of things that have to be done. You also might wanna take this time to work on a skill or a hobby that you're interested in. You might wanna self-reflect on things that make you happy and, and do those like listening to podcasts or painting or reading or playing an instrument. This is a, a great time when you're worried about your mental health and when you wanna preserve it and restore it to do things that make you passionate and figure out what makes you happy. What doesn't, automate and delegate whenever you can. Spend time in nature. It's a great way uh, to recharge yourself. Set your music to match the task. So if, you, if you're not inspired by rap, <laughs> so don't put rap on. If you're more inspired by jazz and you want to decompress, there's nothing wrong with putting that on either. And then being a caregiver to your own career. If you find your identity in work, and I have to tell you, there is nothing wrong with that. And for some, working on their professional development is caring for their mental health. There are many ways that you can develop yourself professionally. Insight and perspective is so important. You have to know what feels best for you. And sometimes when you feel like your problems are growing, the only way that you can overcome them is when you feel like you're growing at the same time. I completely understand that. So can you look for ways to develop leadership skills? Can you learn a new way to design? Can you learn design itself? How can you increase your emotional intelligence? Can you learn coding and programming? Can you learn um, what it means to do design thinking? Can you learn marketing? Can you learn storytelling? Can you command an executive presence? Can you learn what it means to motivate your colleagues? Can you get into the qualitative and actually learn finance and accounting? Also, getting to know people at work and paying close attention to their words and ideas can help you to be a caregiver to others at work. Acknowledging their important religious and cultural holidays and life milestones, well, that's just honing your relationship building skills, which also builds a relationship and preserves your mental health. Get more intentional about the things you do. Do you remember your colleagues' names or an unusual hobby? Sorry, got to admit somebody. Or an unusual hobby that they picked up. Um, instead of asking just, did you have a good weekend? This is the real time where we all got to peek in each other's homes. I mean, you're in my home right now and peel back the curtain and really show emotional intelligence at its best. That is one of the strongest ways to be a caregiver at work. And it's crucial to build a relationship right now to preserve our mental health that is empathy centered, which no matter the work arrangement will be to your benefit. Show your team that you trust them. So don't, don't obsess with the particulars of how something is done. I mean, everybody has shown that they can work independently because it's been crunch time for so many of us. Instead, focus on what everyone is accomplishing. Establish ahead of time what behaviors and skills demonstrate leadership or demonstrate a team. 
and then make writing skills your new superpower. Uh, I know that we all love email and Slack and Zoom and communicating this way, but one of the easiest ways to up our collaboration game is just to communicate more effectively by writing. Are you setting clear deadlines? Are you clearly communicating tasks? Or are you making somebody's life harder by leaving gray areas? Do you know when you're giving feedback how your tone will be perceived? If you're establishing new relationships at work, are you conveying trust and confidence? All of that becomes important right now when everybody's mental health is being tested. And I recently read in Bloomberg Business Week that solutions for your mental health at work have to go beyond treating symptoms like exhaustion and anxiety. And instead of merely just prescribing rest for everybody and exercise and healthful eating, it's time to deconstruct that underlying cultural source of burnout and do something else that's really radical and taboo, which is practice time management and work less. Doesn't mean cut your hours. It just means it's time to work smarter and not harder to help yourself and to help others at work. So when you're setting meetings, ask yourself, is this meeting necessary? Or can it be an email? How many people need to be in the meeting? Do I need to invite everyone on the team or can I just invite one person? And then also when someone isn't participating in the office, again, be their ally, take notice and support them, amplify their voice, invite them to speak and share their expertise. They may not have that sense of ambient belonging. How can you foster that as an ally for somebody else and being a caregiver for somebody else in the office? Providing regular and quality formal and informal feedback and constructive criticism keeping in mind that everyone's mental health right now is so fragile. And then being a caregiver by managing upward. I absolutely love this because you can be a caregiver to your manager too. And here's how. Communicate challenges that you're having, both personal and professional. There's nothing wrong with that. Don't sit on bad news because a minor issue can develop into a major one if it's not, if it's ignored. It's Better to share problems or issues with your manager straight away before they escalate. And then communicate how to get the best performance from you. It's a good sign when managers ask their subordinates how to be managed, but it's an even better sign when you tell them how you like to be managed. So whether you're new to an organization or if it's just a part of a conversation that you're having as a team with the managers, it's, he it's healthy to have that conversation and provide that valuable piece of knowledge. And there's nothing wrong with you initiating that conversation, provided that you do it in the right way and respect that they may have their own method. Push back. If you, if you feel like you may not be needed in a meeting, or if you feel like there is a project that you cannot handle at this time, push back, communicate, speak for yourself, develop that sense of belonging. Sometimes you have to be proactive about that. Communicate in advance, uh, prepare in advance when you can so that you know and you can clearly communicate when something doesn't sit right with you and is testing your mental health. And then communicate then demonstrate, then remind managers of your expertise. I used to have a manager who said, tell them what you're going to do, do it, and then remind them of what you did. That's this one, pretty much. Your manager is your senior, not your superior. So if they're at all sensible, they hired you because you're better than they are at something. So don't be shy about sharing your skills or your knowledge. Be a team player and a cross-functional team problem solver. So suggest solutions to problems. Everybody loves the problem solver on the team. Just don't get bogged down with that role. But one surefire way to win your manager's good favor is to suggest solutions to problems rather than simply draw attention to them. So where can you support their mental health and yours in the long run, right? Because you're managing your manager. Um, and just make sure that you can find yourself being a proactive problem solver and a team player and a, a, a solutions provider. Understand the manager's key drivers and motivators. So take the time to understand your manager's vision for the team, their, their function or their organization. 
watch how they behave in meetings and how they react to pressure and try to understand what their stressors are. And that will allow you to support them in a more professional way as they should you, but it also makes your workload a little bit lighter and more pleasant. At the moment, your mental health is of the utmost importance. Its stability will help you to find success in the short and the long term. Can you request a different schedule? Is that how you can preserve your mental health? Can you, uh, what can you say not at this time to? So think about these things as you're thinking about preserving your mental health, but also managing your manager and also supporting your colleagues. So I'm gonna take a second here and we're gonna do just one more grounding exercise to reset. So inhale for four seconds. Hold for seven while I admit. Exhale for eight. And we'll do another timeout. Inhale for four. Hold for seven. Exhale for eight. Okay. That was a great segue into the emotion wheel. If you're familiar with the, the emotion wheel, it was created by psychologist Robert Plutchik, I believe is how it's pronounced, to identify basic emotions. The reason I show this is because psychologists believe that the emotion wheel can be used in the workplace to help employees harness their emotions rather than suppress them. If that energy is channeled effectively, then emotions will have, excuse me, employees will have better morale and better productivity rates. So the good news is that anyone can examine their own emotions for less than three minutes by taking an emotional wheel break. Are you feeling sad? But is it deeper than that? Are you feeling lonely? And is it deeper than that? Do you feel inadequate in the space that you're in, for example? By even visualizing the emotion wheel for some people, it can help us slow down, think more clearly, think more objectively, be more self-aware, be more focused, more diplomatic and emotionally intelligent. And for those who feel like they're really struggling with their mental health, you can always visit mhascreening.org and check your symptoms. It's free, it's confidential, it's anonymous. Once you have the results, MHA will give you information and resources to help you start to feel better. Or you can always ask your primary care physician and make an appointment, psychologytoday.com, a uh, great resource for those of you who are uh, Black, there's Therapy for Black Girls, which is another great resource. It's a network of Black therapists and mental health professionals. Don't get discouraged if you end up not being able to find the therapist that's right for you on the first visit. Therapy and medications, if you're prescribed, take time to work. The fact that you're dedicated to finding a solution for your mental health problems that you might be experiencing at the moment is admirable. Um, don't stick with anybody that you feel isn't right for you, but do give yourself time to get adjusted. And then I wanted to end by showing you guys a very powerful video, a very powerful TED talk from a gentleman who was struggling with his mental health and the stigma associated with mental health, especially in the Black community, especially in, with men. Um, but I think that it is so powerful. So I wanted to share how, what he, how he summarizes pretty much his journey to understanding his mental health. That our mental struggles do not detract from our virility, nor does our trauma taint our strength. We need to see mental health as important as physical health. We need to stop suffering in silence. We must stop stigmatizing disease and traumatizing the afflicted. Talk to your friends. Talk to your loved ones. Talk to health professionals. Be vulnerable. Do so with the confidence that you are not alone. Speak up if you are struggling. Being honest about how we feel does not make us weak. It makes us human. 
it is time to end the stigma associated with mental illness. So the next time you hear mental, do not just think of the madman. Think of me. I absolutely just, I will share. I've, I've been getting private chats. I will share uh, for everybody the link to that video as well as the link to Alyssa. It's okay to not be your most productive self right now. It's also okay, though, to take charge of your mental health, to reach out for and accept help. Remind yourself that your emotions are normal and justified. And if you find yourself judging your emotions or your responses, studies have found that viewing them as something wrong with you for reacting so strongly actually increases your anxiety. So instead, say something to yourself like you are going through a crisis and you are reacting in a normal way to an abnormal situation. You have a very demanding and very important role in our society. And you are reacting in a normal way to an abnormal situation in a unique position. All in all, it's most important that we understand some people suffer from social isolation. Some people are nervous about being around others. Some people thrive in being around others. Some feel their mental health is being tested by being a nurse or CND. Some find that role in their lives absolutely exhilarating. Everyone can feel different, but what we have to do is respect each other's situation and differences. So I thank you very much for the honor of speaking with you this evening. And thank you for joining me in this discussion. And thank you for sharing with me your thoughts and where you are right now. I encourage you to follow me on social and connect with me offline as I offer a wealth of other resources on my blog as well, especially for working moms. And are there any questions or should there be any questions? I'll now open up the floor for questions or thoughts or comments. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me.